Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen. We're going to move from the animal kingdom to the humans specifically. So I guess we can focus on one group of animals if you want to think about it that way. So we're going to talk about the 11 organ systems, the organization of the human body, and kind of some of the functions of some of the major systems over this lecture and the next one. The integrated parts of the body divide up tasks, which means it's a division of labor. We move from cells to multicellular organisms, and we are at the organ system level of organization. A tissue, as a reminder, is a community of cells specialized for particular tasks. An organ consists of two or more tissues working together, and an organ system consists of different organs working to accomplish a common task. And we have 11 organ systems in our body, and we'll go over that after we review some of the tissues. We have four major types of tissues in our body. We have connective tissues, muscle tissues, nervous tissues, and epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues are pictured on the upper left. That is simple squamous epithelium. Connective tissues are on the right. That is called areolar connective tissue. On the lower left is an example of muscular tissue, and that muscular tissue is smooth muscle. And on the right is an example of nervous tissue, which consists of neurons and neuro neuroglia or glial cells. So first let's take a look at the epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues are characterized by having one surface that is free, in other words, exposed to an environment of some sort, and the other is adhered to a basement membrane. In simple epithelium, it's only one cell thick. It can be flat, which is called squamous, cuboidal, which looks like cubes, or columnar, which look like columns, in shape. Stratified epithelium, though, has many layers, such as that found in human skin. So if you take a look at the left-hand picture, um, that type of tissue is called pseudostratified columnar epithelium. In other words, it looks like it's stratified, but it isn't really. And it is columnar, ciliated, um, and so it's pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. You find this lining your <clears throat> lung passageways, so your bronchia, bronchus, your trachea, etc. Over on the right hand side is simple cuboidal epithelium and you can see the basement brain as a ring around that uh, <clears throat> line of cuboidal epithelium and that is lining one of the kidney tubules. Okay, connective tissues. Most connective tissues contain cells and fibers that are secreted by the cells that are scattered around inside of a, a system called a matrix. There are soft connective tissues like areolar connective tissue that supports epithelium in organs and surrounds nerves and blood vessels. So it's basically almost like a shock absorber or a cushion. Some specialized connective tissues include cartilage, and cartilage is pictured in the second one from on the bottom. So it's the middle picture on the bottom. Cartilage cushions and maintains the shape of certain body parts. Bone, which is in the upper right hand side, that's compact bone that you see there. It stores mineral salts, produces blood cells, and provides overall body support. Adipose tissue, which is on the upper left hand side, so first one on the top column, is a storage tissue for fat and provides cushioning for internal organs. Blood, which is the third one over on the right hand, uh, on the top column, um, transports oxygen, wastes, hormones, nutrients, and enzymes around the body. Muscle tissue contracts in response to stimulation and then passively lengthens. In other words, it can tighten, but it has to relax by itself. Skeletal muscle tissue attaches to bones for voluntary movement and it contains striations or stripes. You can see skeletal muscle tissue on the bottom picture. That's skeletal. Smooth muscle tissue, which is in the upper right, is usually found in the gut or the blood vessels and glands. 
It is involuntary, in other words, you can't control it, and does not contain striations. Cardiac muscle tissue, which is on the upper left, is an unusual tissue because it is involuntary, but it's striated. It does have the stripes, but it is involuntary. You can recognize uh, cardiac tissue because it has those branches, so you see those big white spaces. It also has those straight up and down lines throughout the tissue called intercalated discs, which helps the muscle to contract as a single unit. Nervous tissue controls the greatest proportion of the body's responses to a changing environment, and it consists of two types of cells, neurons, or nerve cells, and neuroglia, which protect and metabolically support the nerve cells. So basically they have their own set of cells just to feed them, basically. Okay, so those are the four main types of tissue. Now we're going to move on to the organ systems, and we'll talk about specific organs in those systems as we go along. The 11 organ systems contribute to the survival of the living cells of the vertebrate body, and you can remember them using the mnemonic, Run Mrs. Lydeck, and that helps you to remember them uh, and make sure that you don't repeat. So they are the respiratory, urinary, nervous, muscular, reproductive, skeletal, lymphatic, integumentary, digestive, endocrine, and cardi cardiovascular. So uh, that's not in the same order that you see it here on the picture, but that is the way that you can remember uh, the order uh, of the 11 systems so that you don't forget one. So let's talk about the integumentary system. We're going to start from the outside and work our way inside. And the integumentary system is basically just the outer covering of any animal body, which is called the integument. Remember in some of the invertebrates it was called uh, a cuticle and, and so on, but it is still the integument. In vertebrates, the integument consists of skin and the structures that are derived from epidermal cells, like scales, feathers, hair, beaks, horns, nails, and so forth, in an, out, in an outer epidermis and underlying dermis. The skin covers and protects the body from abrasion, bacterial attack, ultraviolet radiation, and dehydration. It helps to control the internal temperature and helps to make vitamin D. It is also part of the sensory system, and it has sensory receptors to help the brain detect environmental stimulus. The dermis lies beneath the epidermis, and it rests on the hypodermis, which is not actually technically part of the skin, but contains loose connective tissue and fat. The dense connective tissue of the dermis cushions the body against everyday stretching and mechanical stretch stresses. That's why your skin doesn't tear off when you rub into something. Blood vessels, lymph vessels, and receptors of sensory nerves are embedded in the dermis. Sweat glands produce a fluid that is released in response to stress, such as overheating or fright. And oil glands, called sebaceous glands, are also present in the dermis, and they lubricate and soften the skin. Plus, they produce secretions that reduce bacterial populations of the skin. That's why certain cultures actually don't bathe very often because that natural sebaceous oil helps to prevent bacterial infection. In our society, though, um, that's considered unhygienic, and so we typically don't do that. Each hair that it starts in the dermis is a flexible structure that is rooted in the dermis and projects above the epidermis, and it is used for not only uh, warmth but also for... Uh, sensory systems. Okay, one of the key things about um, our dermis is that it does protect us from ultraviolet radiation. When we receive ultraviolet radiation in higher doses than we can handle, it creates damage. And our response to that tissue damage is tanning. So when you tan, you've actually damaged your skin and the tanning is the skin's last-ditch response to try and prevent further damage. So when our skin gets 
exposed to ultraviolet light, it stimulates the melanocytes in our skin to produce melanin, which produces that tan. Continued exposures to ultraviolet rays, whether we're talking about the sun or whether we're talking about a tanning bed, it doesn't matter. Um, they cause a loss of elasticity, and you can see that the, the woman's skin in this picture is sagging, and it's not just because of her age. Uh, she's actually in her 50s, so that should give you a hint. So we lose elasticity because it damages the collagen fibers and it causes a dwindling of glandular secretions. In short, it ages the skin. Ultraviolet light attacks the cell's DNA, which leads to skin cancer. Skeletons support the body. Animals move by the action of muscles, which need some medium or structural element against which the force of contraction can be applied. Vertebrate skeletons are divided into two major portions, the appendicular and the axial. In this picture, you can see the axial is in green and the appendicular is in purple. The appendicular skeleton consists of the pectoral girdle, which is made up of the clavicle and scapula, with the attached upper limbs, and the pelvic girdle, which is the hip bones, essentially. It's a fusion of three bones, and the lower limbs. The axial skeleton includes the skull, vertebral column, which is individual bones separated by cartilaginous in invertebral discs, the ribs, and the sternum. Bones have several roles in the body. They interact with muscles to maintain or change the position of body parts. They support the skin and soft organs. They form compartments that enclose and protect soft internal organs. For example, a skull protects the brain. And bone tissue acts as a depository for calcium, phosphorus, and other ions. Parts of some bones are sites of also of blood cell production, both white and red blood cells. Joints are the areas of contact or near contact between bones. Freely movable joints are stabilized by ligaments, which are straps of dense connective tissue that attach bone to bone. Cartilaginous joints, such as between the ribs, permit very slight movement, because your ribs can technically flex. Joints, however, are vulnerable to stress. Stretching or twisting a joint may result in a strain, which is the tearing of ligaments or tendons off of that bone. Um, and uh, if you have uh, tearing completely, it's called a sprain. So most people go, oh, it's just a sprained ankle or whatever. That's actually a tearing off of ligaments off of your uh, bone or tendons. In osteoarthritis, the cartilage at the end of the bone has worn away, and so bone is now grinding on bone, causing roughened surfaces, inflammation, and pain. In rheumatoid arthritis, that's an autoimmune disease, and the body basically starts to attack itself, and the membranes in the joints become inflamed, and the cartilage will degenerate, and bone, it becomes deposited into the joint until fusion happens. Skeletal muscles are functional partners with the bones. Each skeletal muscle contains several bundles of perhaps hundreds of thousands of muscle cells called muscle fibers. Each individual cell is called a fiber. Tendons, which are cord-like straps of dense connective tissue, attach muscle to bone. So the, the way to remember it is bone to bone is ligaments, muscle to bone is tendons, and it goes in alphabetical order. Skeletal muscles are often arranged in antagonistic pairs, which means that they interact with one another and with, bo uh, with bone. Antagonistic means one will flex and one will extend joint. Um, so it, for example, your biceps and triceps. Your biceps are on the front of your upper arm, and your triceps are on the back. Your biceps flex your elbow, in other words, they bring the elbow closer together, and your triceps extend the elbow, so it, ex it expands the angle of the elbow. 
Because most muscle attachments are located close to joints, only a small contraction is needed to produce considerable movements of some body parts. Skeletal muscles contract using what's called the sliding filament theory. Muscles shorten because the sarcomeres inside, that, inside the muscle fiber itself shorten within each cell using the sliding filament model. The mechanism pulls these discs together. See the Z discs on this diagram. It pulls them together and pulls the actin filaments toward the center of the sarcomere. In other words, the contracting unit. A sarcomere is a contracting unit inside the fiber. By forming cross bridges, the myosin filaments slide along and pull the actin filaments toward the center of the sarcomere. It look, the myosin filaments look like golf club heads, and basically they ratchet the actin filaments closer together. They overlap. The cross bridges are formed when the local connection of calcium exposes the, the binding sites, and then the myosin heads can interact with the actin. And ATP supplies, this, supplies the energy for both attachment and detachment. So this is how um, rigor mortis happens, because basically you run out of ATP after you die because you're not making anymore. Your mitochondria are dead. Your cells are dead. And so basically what happens is the myosin heads get locked in, a, in position, and they don't have any ATP to help them to relax it, to let go. And so you have rigor mortis um, holding those muscles locked tight. However, um, after a bit of time, and it depends on the temperature and a whole lot of other stuff, but after a bit of time, rigor relaxes, and that's just because those myosin heads have started to degrade enough that they unlock just by basically dissolving. On that happy note, we're going to end, and we will be moving on into some of the transport systems, response systems, defense, and reproduction systems of the human body in the next lecture. Have a great day.